So as you see, I mean, we got an amazing group of people here from very diverse backgrounds, but all focused on the same thing, and that is how do we accelerate innovation in education? And so what we're trying to do here over the next couple of days is to connect dots, connect people, go outside boundaries, all with the idea of what can we do to have game-changing ideas that make a material difference and how we help more people participate in the future. So when you look about connecting people, one of the things that we think is critical is that we get these kind of people with different backgrounds, different experiences, but all focused on this mission and create this chemistry that really uh, amazing things can happen from. So when you go to Chemistry 101, here's the periodic table. Everybody knows the periodic table with the different elements. And you know these unique elements are interesting by themselves, but what really becomes amazing is when you put them together with something. So you get two H's plus an O, and that equals water. And so what we want to do is create a lot of different combinations of people here with this idea of how we make big things happen. Um, before I make a few more comments in terms of making things happen and to help you, you heard a bunch of people in this room had GSV in front of it. And so what I'd like you to do, anybody from GSV, just stand up really quickly, please. So everybody here from GSV is here to help you make this next couple days incredibly productive. And so uh, please take a look around. Don't hesitate. I know already a um, bunch of people said, can I meet this person? Can I get this done, et cetera? But this is what you're here to do. So don't hesitate, please, to, to, to do that. And secondly, Carrie Rodigero and, uh, and uh, what's that? He's always hiding. He's hiding. Steve Levin. If, if, if Steve Levin are here somewhere. There's Steve. Where's Carrie? Hiding. Hiding. What I'd like you to actually do is, because they're the two people that actually did all the work to make this happen, so if you could just give them another round of applause, that'd be great. So in terms of connecting dots, when you think about it, this class of 2020 that just came to campus um, this fall, you know, it's a very interesting group. Um, they were born, obviously, 18 years ago. And 18 years ago, that was the same year that another thing was born, that was, that was Google. And so this generation, this class of 2020, basically has grown up in a world where everything, information is ubiquitous and free. The world I grew up in, information was both expensive and difficult, and water was free, but that's a whole different thing. So these people, they expect, basically, to have it, you know, information at their fingertips. Also 18 years ago, Steve Jobs just came back to Apple for a second tour. Uh, basically making technology um, ubiquitous in, in the hands of, of everybody and really exciting. Um, this generation of class of 2020, the smartphone isn't a smartphone, it's a, it's a phone. Effectively, it really is a supercomputer in their pocket and they do everything from it, they love it. So whether it's getting transportation, or food, or products, I mean that's how they conduct their life. We're an investor in a company called Enjoy, Ron Johnson, the former head of Apple stores, um, is the head of, and basically what Enjoy does is brings the genius bar from Apple uh, with Uber and brings you products to your home, to your office, well, what you want, where you want it, um, when you want it. So Netflix brings you entertainment to your fingertips, basically almost all the entertainment in the world that you can have off of your smartphone. And so binge watching, this whole idea of not having to wait a week to see your favorite TV series I mean, that's what this generation expects. So it's not a mystery, this class of 2020, when they look at things like having to take an economics class at 8 o'clock on Thursday morning, they think it's absurd. Why would that be the way that they operate? In fact, 50% of this class of 2020 likes, thinks that online cl classes are as good or better than the physical classes. That's very, very different than what you have seen five years ago. This generation has no memory of the dot-com bubble and, 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 and the fact that it, when it burst. But they have very vivid recollection of their friend's family who had their house foreclosed. And not a coincidence, the millennial generation basically doesn't like to own anything. In fact, homes, which used to be like the first thing you wanted to have, uh, basically home ownership has dropped 30% from them as a, as a direct result of kind of what they've experienced. And they also remember their parents that lost their job, and not only their job, but the pension that went along with it. They had their entire career basically wrapped up in one company. And so again, not as a coincidence, 
this generation will have 15 different careers between the time they, they graduate from college and when they retire, if they ever retire. But they will have unique jobs in this whole gig economy, and maybe it's driving for, for Lyft, and, and uh, we're a proud investor in Lyft, but the fact of the matter is, that's how they think, that's how they operate. What's really interesting statistic to me is that more cars were sold last year to people aged 75 years old than 18 to 24 year olds. And that's just, you know, that's, but that's how this works. When you connect dots, you know, it's, it's uh, really important how you see different things and you put them together. And that's, again, what we're hoping to do. We have a bunch of really fascinating speakers over the next couple of days, and we've purposely brought them here for their unique perspective on the world and what's going on. I'd like you to do a real quick exercise, though. In front of you, there's a, there's a piece of paper with uh, nine dots on it. And what I'd like you to do is take a pen and not take your pen off the paper, and I'd like you to connect these dots with four lines, four straight lines. I'll give you about a minute to do it. All right, so anybody, anybody able to accomplish that? So I, I knew David Blake would be able to do that. So I'll do it real quick for you, ready? Here's how you do it. And so the key is you gotta think outside of bounds. That's why I invested in David Blake. Because you got to basically to accomplish that goal, you got to think outside of boundaries, and that's um, one of the things that we hope we can accomplish in terms of a mindset over the next couple of days. When you think outside of boundaries, also, it's seeing the dots, right? You got to not only think outside of boundaries. What dots do you see amongst all this noise? How do you create? How do you see signals amongst this noise? So if you look at this picture, how many people see dots? Do you see 36 dots? So if you take your head and you look up in the very right corner, the dots disappear. For a lot, they do. For a lot of people, they, 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 they disappear. So it's kind of an interesting exercise, but the point is they're there, right? They haven't disappeared, but that's how you see them. And so as we look at these different dots that exist, these signals amongst all this noise, we're trying to piece things together. So some of those dots that we're seeing a bunch of disparate things about how you put them together. Everything free, Internet of Things, virtual reality, Brexit, Trump, adaptive technology, on-demand everything, globalization, women power, Asia and Africa rising, rising middle class. What does that have to do with education acceleration? Now, some things you say nothing, in a lot of ways it's everything. And so what we're trying to do is connect these different dots into cohesive themes that really think about what the future looks like. So we have themes like knowledge as a currency, return on education, mobile, big data, Kaizen ADU, mind, body, soul, Hollywood meets Harvard. These are just some of the themes that we put together as we try to connect dots, but we hope we can connect other dots and really think about where the world's heading and why and what we're going to do about it. So we're also here to debunk myths. So at one point, the people thought the world was flat. A hundred years ago, it was thought that athletes' performance was enhanced by smoking cigarettes. These are, these are riders in the Tour de France. <laughs> so again, that was conventional wisdom that basically smoking cigarettes was going to help you perform better. So obviously, that was a bad myth. You know, 30 years ago, Sears Roebuck was the largest retailer in the world, and conventional wisdom was that how you became a very successful business is you created as much margin as you could in selling your products to people. You want value, but then Walmart debunked that myth and said, we're going to make more money by selling things for less, and they became the largest retailer in the world. And then Amazon came along and took it one step further, and again, the cynics and the skeptics basically talked about how this company was going to go away, I'm Amazon.bomb, and analysts questioned viability. That happened, by the way, not once, but twice. It was 2001, 2008. People actually questioned whether Amazon was going to exist. So 
I um, mean, look at how things change in such a material way in a very short period of time. 25 years ago, these were the five largest market cap companies in the world, and most of these companies started 100 years or, or more ago. I mean, Philip Morris was started in 1847. In 1991, it was the second largest company in the world. Look at today. Um, here are the five largest market cap companies in the world. You know, they're all basically based in San Francisco and Seattle. Apple, Alphabet, Microsoft, Amazon. Amazon didn't go away. I guess it's the fourth most valuable company in the world. And Facebook. Amazing. And then you look at the global Silicon Valley, which is a theme that you know, we're actually our company is named after. You got companies like Alibaba, ninth largest market cap company in the world. Tencent, the 11th largest market cap company in the world. China Mobile, 12th largest market cap company in the world. And guess what? These companies didn't exist 20 years ago. Amazing. Also thinking outside the boundaries. Bob Dylan, Nobel Prize in Literature, 2016. That was connecting some dots. New York Times, redefining boundaries in, of literature. Amazing. Great quote. Some people feel the rain, others just get wet. We want to feel the rain, right? We want, to, we want to understand what's really going on, paying attention to it. He also had another great quote. Colleges are like old age homes, except for the fact that more people die in colleges. <laughs> anyway. So uh, Deborah talked about this last night, but just um, we, we couldn't be more excited about the people that we have here. Peter Schwartz, I'm, I'm personally thrilled to have him. I've been a huge fan of for many, many years. Uh, one of the great strategists and strategic thinkers in the world. He's the chief strategist at, at uh, Salesforce today. We'll give him a proper introduction in a few seconds. The author of The Long Boom, which is a seminal piece that he wrote. Um, we have uh, Dave Schiff, one of the truly great brand um, people in the world, and uh, in particularly in how social media and this next generation thinks and, and, and behaves. Um, one of their advertisers, Bill Salman, uh, who's a comedian, but also a Harvard business professor leading their entrepreneurship efforts for many years. Again, I'm a huge personal fan of. He runs the Rock Center for Entrepreneurship at HBS. Harriet Seitler, who is the COO for 20 years for, for Oprah Winfrey. Um, obviously, Oprah, mega brand, mega media business. Everybody look under their chair right now. Somebody's got, a, somebody's got an automobile. No, I'm just kidding, you don't. <laughs> Senator Michael Bennett, obviously, a a true leader in education, innovation, and transformation. Be here later this afternoon. Um, tonight at the Saddle Ridge Lodge, the old Lehman Lodge, will be a great dinner and a great time to share. Undersecretary of Education Ted Mitchell, friend of a number of people in this room. A great panel on emerging technologies tomorrow with an amazing group of, of, of visionaries. Todd Rose, the end of average Harvard business, or Harvard professor, Again, not a more influential thinker in the education world today than Todd. We couldn't be more excited. So we've got a great day ahead of us. And before I introduce Peter, um, as, as you know, we've got a, a very special uh, person in the audience, Governor Roy Romer, former governor of Colorado. And last night, I said it would be a real shame if we didn't take advantage of having him here to give you a few, few thoughts. So uh, with that, I'm going to have Governor Romer say a few words. Governor Romer, thank you. I didn't ask for this assignment. <laughs> I understand the work you have to do. So in, in a very quick five minutes, I want to tell you two things. Um, one, vocationally, I uh, was governor 12 years and did some other things. But after that, I chose to be uh, in education. And I was looking for the toughest job I could find in America. And I became school superintendent of Los Angeles. And I was there for seven years. And so I um, have devoted a good bit of my uh, life uh, with education. The two things I want to share with you are one, performance, uh, uh, performance measures in education. I, in the course of my career, have done a number of things. I used to own and operate a small ski area, but I'm a pilot, so I owned and operated a flight school. <coughs> and uh, we would train people up to Learjet 
And uh, when you come in and try to solo, some of you will do it in 15 hours, some of you in 27 hours. It's not how long you sit in the seat. It's you need to demonstrate that you have the skill that's required. And I was experienced in that, and I kept watching higher education in my state and saying, damn, it's all, you know, how many hours you sit in the seat and how many Carnegie units. And I kept saying, can't performance education work? So uh, Mike Levitt and I, Governor of Utah, teamed together and created Western Governors University. And as I look back in my career in education, I didn't recognize the significance of it then, but uh, I think it's one of the most important things uh, that uh, I was involved with. Um, secondly, connecting the docs and the chemistry. I gotta tell you a quick story. Um, I was governor of Colorado and uh, <clears throat> the Big Eight was being hosted in Denver. Clinton was president, Bill Clinton. And um, we had an old three-story mansion in which I lived in with uh, how many kids? Seven. Uh, and the rugs were pretty damn ratty. So with all the world's leaders coming for that weekend, um, Tony Blair, Boris Yeltsin, I went out and rented rugs for the hallways. And so Bill Clinton and I are standing at the door waiting for the first of the world leaders to come in and Clinton was impatient, he kept wiping his feet. And I turned to him and he was a personal friend but you always call him Mr. President. And I said, Mr. President, uh, do, do you mind not wiping your feet on my rug? I rented them and I gotta return them on Monday. And uh, he broke up into great, great laughter. Right at that moment, Boris Yeltsin walks in. And you don't laugh in front of the Prime Minister of Russia <laughs> unless you explain what the, what's the joke. So <laughs> through an interpreter, Bill Clinton was telling Boris Yeltsin, hey, uh, Boris, we gotta be careful in this uh, cocktail party we're about to have here because Romer rented the rugs, he's gotta return them on Monday and, and we just gotta be sure to keep them clean. And Boris turned into great, great uh, laughter over that. And, excuse me, the technology world. <laughs> and so as Tony Blair and everybody else walked in the door, Boris, who's a very outgoing personality, kept having to corner each one of them, personally saying, hey, be careful, be careful. These rugs are rented. <laughs> Romer's got to take them back. So the chemistry of the beginning of that world meeting was absolutely beautiful because everybody was worried about Romer's rugs rather than the world. Um, I, I just got to make one final comment. Uh, I'm so pleased to be here among you. Uh, the, uh, I'm 88. I'm still working on this agenda of education as my family is. And I, I got to tell you, uh, I never have felt a more critical time. Um, the day before the first debates, I literally was ill. It wasn't about worrying about how the candidates were going to do that night. It was the damn polls that I was reading. 50% of this nation was teetering in Colorado as to which side they were on. And I got to tell you, um, the headlines in the New York Times today, first two columns, public jolted his campaign turns coarser. Next headline, officials fight Trump's claim of a rigged vote. I'm a real student of history and democratic institutions. The key to a democratic institution is when you lose by 1%, you hand the keys to the next person and say, this system works, I'm all for you. We are endangering that. And I've a, read a hell of a lot of history and we got to educational job to do with our children, but we also have an educational job to do with the culture of this nation. And so I know you got a lot of dots to connect and you got a lot of power in technology, but technology can be something that can inform people, but also it can be a way of passing information without screening. And I'm living in a society in which I'm very anxious, so do a good job for us. We need more education. Thank you.